Well, if you will, this morning, please turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 5. And I read a story this week about a prominent public figure, and he would often have to uh, greet people in, in long lines, people coming to see him and meet him at his house. And he complained because so often, Nobody ever really listened to anything he'd have to say, he'd, you know, just shake their hands and talk to them and they weren't even paying attention. So he thought, well, one time, I think I'm gonna tell them I murdered my grandmother this morning. So that's what he did. He was greeting people and one by one and he, he would tell them, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And the response was people just said, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for such a good job you're doing. God bless you, sir. Until finally he got to the very end and someone actually was paying attention to what he said. And uh, so he told them, I murdered my grandmother this morning. And the person just kind of leaned in and said, well, she probably had it coming. <laughs> now, I don't know if that story's true or not, but it is true that so few people uh, listen today. Everybody wants to be heard. They want their voice to be out there. But the art of listening has fallen out of favor. And this morning, I want to bring a message to you about the importance of not only listening, but believing in Jesus, hearing his word and believing. Uh, last week I was privileged with uh, bringing the final message in the church life and I'm so thankful for that and the previous time I was in the pulpit I preached this series uh, is the, the first message of a series that I had developed on the salvation in the gospel of John the doctrine of salvation and it's just a quick four-part series and I believe that in this we can see that Jesus is the word of life. Not only does he possess the words of life in his preaching and his teaching that is recorded in scripture, but he himself is the word and we must believe in him. And so if you will, uh, please stand with me for the reading of God's word. We're gonna be in John chapter five and we're gonna read verses 19 to 29 and the word of God says so Jesus said to them truly truly I say to you the son can do nothing of his own accord but only what he sees the father doing for whatever the father does that the son does likewise for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but is given all judgment to the son, so that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself and he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out and those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment let us bow for a word of prayer Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, we humbly come before your throne of grace this morning and we ask, Lord, for uh, open ears so that we can hear and, uh, Lord, soft hearts so that we can receive 
and, and apply that truth of your word to our life. Let it change us, Lord, and uh, may we be obedient to you, uh, not out of a sense of obligation, but out of a sense of love because you sent your son to die for us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love the Gospel of John. It is probably my favorite book, but I, I often say that about other books too. But when I was, had the opportunity in seminary to write a paper on the doctrine of salvation in the Gospel of John, I knew right away that I wanted to turn it into a sermon series. And the reason why the Apostle John wrote the Gospel, uh, he puts it in uh, the very Gospel itself in John chapter 20 and verse 31. He put, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. When I was studying the Gospel of John, I literally, I just took everything in the whole book and I looked for anything that talked about people who would receive eternal life, those who would receive salvation. And I found four things. Those who would be drawn by the Father to the Son would not be cast out, but he would receive them. They would, he would give them eternal life. Those who hear and believe the Son would also receive eternal life. Those who follow after Jesus would receive eternal life. And those who had fellowship or communion with Christ would receive eternal life. And as I was studying, I didn't see four different ways that people could be saved or go to heaven. Instead, I saw one process that shows the full picture of salvation. Pastors have often used uh, a past, present, and, and future uh, tenses when it comes to salvation. In the book of Ephesians, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that uh, God determined before the foundation of the earth when he knew that he would create the world, the universe, that he would create man in his image, that man would fall and would need a savior. And he determined that he would create a uh, specific people that he would redeem for his own, that he would give to his son. And so in that sense, we were saved before the foundation of the earth. We were saved before we were even born because God is sovereign and he, he, all that he wills comes to pass. But also, we can look back on the day that we were saved. We can remember the day that the Father led us to Christ and that we heard the gospel and we believed and we trusted him. But there's also a, a present tense in which not only have we been saved from the eternal consequences of sin, right? That's justification when we put our faith in Christ, but daily, Every day as we read God's word, as we allow it to change us, to uh, transform us, we become more and more like Christ. And daily we're being saved from the effects of sin. All of us who've been saved, we, we have that one time we're justified, we're seen as innocent before God because we received Christ's righteousness. But that doesn't mean we, we're never going to have to deal with sin in the world. It's still here. It'd be great if when we're saved we could just, you know, be teleported up into heaven. But God has blessed us with the privilege of bringing the gospel to others as well so that they can hear and believe. And so in a sense, we're daily being saved from the presence of sin. And then in the future, when Christ returns to receive up his bride, and he, he puts to an end, once and for all, death and sin, then we're gonna be saved from the very presence of sin. The book of Revelation says there's gonna be no evil or sin that enters into the holy city. There won't be death or famine or anything that this present world has. And so a sense, in a sense, we'll be saved from the presence of sin in the future. 
And so in the same way I saw in the Gospel of John this kind of pathway, this chain of redemption by which we're, we were saved and sanctified and we persevere and ultimately experience that communion with God that we all desire. And so today I would like, like to speak about hearing and believing in the word of life. The amazing thing is, is that the word for believe occurs 98 times in the Gospel of John. And so it's no surprise that this is one of the primary means that, you know, we hear Christ, we hear his words, and we believe. The Greek word for believe is the word pistuo. It means to trust or rely upon. It was often used in ancient Greek as a, a legal term for uh, law or uh, contracts between two parties, but it was also used poetically, uh, speaking about how a warrior trusts, he believes in his sword on the battlefield, right? He's relying upon that sword so that he can live and, and escape death. In the Gospel of John, the importance of believing in Jesus can be found in the very first chapter, often referred to the prologue where John says of Jesus in verse 11 and 12, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. It is to those who believe in his name. The contrast between the believing and the unbelieving is constantly presented throughout the Gospel of John. Often case it's the Pharisees who, although they heard the words Jesus spoke, they weren't listening and they did not believe in what he said. The context we find in our passage this morning is actually one that many of you probably know well. It's the healing at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus was in Jerusalem during a time of a, a feast, a festival. And he came to this pool and in this pool, uh, there was this kind of superstition that periodically the water would get stirred up and the first person who would get into the water after it stirred up would be healed of whatever their malady was. And there was a man who had been there for 38 years, but he was never healed and he believed it was because no one was there to help him get into the water. He was lame, he couldn't walk and so people would, would beat him to it. And so Jesus encountered this man and he asked him if he wanted to be healed and Jesus told him to get up and walk. Now this was the Sabbath, but the man did exactly as Jesus said. He, he got up miraculously, his legs were healed, he picked up his bed and he walked and he praised God. And when the Pharisees had seen him, they weren't happy that this man, who they knew, right? Everybody knew he's been here for 38 years. He'd become a part of the, of the pool, right? He was like a pillar or, or a bench. He was there every day for 38 years. And rather than praising God and thanking him for this wonderful miracle, they actually chastised him for doing work on the Sabbath. They said, because he was carrying his, uh, his bed, right, in his hands, he was performing work. And they were totally ignoring the fact that he was walking. I mean, how dense can you be? But that's what legalism brings. They had turned the, the Sabbath rest that God actually gave to man as a gift, as a blessing, and they twisted it into legalism and rather than something to give man rest and blessing was, had become a burden. And so they wanted to find out who it was that healed him on the Sabbath. And they, when they finally come to Jesus and found out it was him, Jesus, you know, he could have uh, used, there was a provision in the law that allowed you to, to do work on the Sabbath if it was saving a life right? It, or, or if someone's uh, cattle was in a ditch and needed to get pulled out, you could even go and, and do that on the Sabbath. 
But instead, Jesus, he, he could have used that, but he didn't. Instead, he appealed to something even greater. Uh, he says, I am God. In verse 17, Jesus answered them, my father is working until now and I'm working. He says, God is working on the Sabbath, my father, and I'm working as well. And that made them even more angry. Not only was he violating the Sabbath in their own mind, but he was making himself equal to God by calling him his father. And so that brings us to our passage this morning, uh, beginning in verse 19, if you will look again. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, that the son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, has, has passed from death to life. Here Jesus explains that he is only doing what he sees his father doing. God the Father is the one who had sent Jesus into the world. Jesus didn't come into the world to be served like a great king that he actually was, but instead he came to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. So not only was Jesus not breaking the letter of the law because there was a provision that was provided for those who to do good on the Sabbath to save a life and surely healing this man who was lame for 38 years would constitute under that. But Jesus was innocent because Jesus is God. He is the very law giver. The Sabbath was given for man, and Jesus was the son of man, but he is also the son of God. And so he warns them that they could not hope to please the Father if they do not honor his only son. And the way that Jesus tells them that they can honor the son is by hearing his word and believing. Look again in verse 24. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Because Jesus is God, he alone has the words of eternal life. In fact, he is the very word of God. John, in the very first verse of the gospel, says of Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Logos, which is the Greek word for word. He is the Word of God. And not only is it important to hear the words of Jesus, but we must believe in them. Like I said, the Pharisees and, and many other heard Jesus speak time and time again. Jesus spoke far more than what we have here in the, in the Bible. Uh, the Gospel of John says that if, if everything Jesus said or did was written in a book, all the books in the world can contain what he did. But John wrote this so that we might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing we would have life in his name. And so Jesus offers this wonderful blessing for those who believe. But he also provides a warning to those who would not believe. He has equally stern words. Look in verses 25 to 29. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, and he has given, uh, and he has granted the son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority 
to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out and those who have done good, the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Jesus tells the Jews that there will come a day when everyone who has ever lived will hear his voice. We see that the word holds life and death in his hand. Just as the father has life in himself, so the son also has life in himself. And he has the authority to raise people from the dead. Just the sound of his voice is enough. Just as Lazarus came out of the tomb, I don't believe Lazarus had a, a decision in the matter. When Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, Lazarus came out. And so in the last days, Jesus will come and the dead will hear his voice and all will be raised. But those who did good or believed in him will have a resurrection of eternal life. Remember, how do we do the work of God? The Bible tells us we're to believe in the Son whom the Father sent. We're to believe in Jesus. But for those who did not believe will be raised and judged according to their evil deeds. This is called the second death at the great white throne judgment, which can be found at the end of Revelation. And whenever Pastor Roy is able to come back, I just want to encourage you guys to uh, attend his Revelation series. It's been awesome. And so there are many who hear the words of Jesus in their lifetime. There are many here today who have probably heard the words of the gospel day after day, year after year in their life. And for those of us who have heard and believed, they are the very words of life. We have no other hope except for Jesus and what he accomplished for us on the cross. And so when we hear the gospel, it's not something that gets old. We love it every time. I can tell you, every time I hear the gospel, every time I hear someone's testimony about how God saved them, I love it because it reminds me that I had that same thing. Jesus saved me. It's the same gospel. But there's also many who come and they don't believe. Maybe they come because that's what they've always done. They've went to church with their parents uh, since they were a kid. So it's kind of become a tradition for them. Maybe they like the social aspect that they get from it. And all those things are good. It's great when the body of Christ comes together and has fellowship. But all of that is meaningless if we, like the Pharisees, hear the word of life but reject it and we don't believe. It's like taking a parachute up with you in a plane, but then jumping off without putting it on first. It does nothing. And so for those of you this morning who have not trusted yet in the word of life, please put your faith and trust in Jesus this morning. He is the only way by which men can be saved. He alone has the words of life as Peter told Jesus when he had given a hard teaching and, and many of the people who were following him left. He turned to his disciples and said, will you leave me too? And he said, where will we go? You alone have the words of life. I can't promise you wealth in this world. I can't promise you prestige or a better marriage. Uh, I can't promise you'll, be look, you'll look better. Uh, it's done nothing for me in that case. But what I can promise you is that Jesus will save you if you trust in him today. Will you put your faith in him? Let us pray. Dear Lord God and Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful that faithful apostles that followed you put down those words so that we can have them today. Only because of your sovereignty that we have them all the way this 
2,000 years later. And Lord, we commit them to our memory. As David said, I've hidden your word in my heart so they may not sin against you. Lord, I pray, please save us this morning with the truth that is in your word, with the gospel. Sanctify us with your word. Sanctify us by the truth. Transform us more and more into the image of your son, Jesus. And Lord, give us strength to endure and let us not neglect this great salvation, this great gift that has been given to us, but let us take that message out into the world who desperately needs to hear about the word of life. We pray in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.